I'm going in exploring open roads, um, gravel roads. I'm going on my mountain bike and trying new skills that I've never done before. Um, so it balances things out for me. And I wish, I so wish I started this, you know, 10 years ago because it would have changed things for me. Cause there came a point in my career, like six years ago. I mean, it, it was tough sometimes, you know, but if I just had a mountain bike, and just went out and enjoyed being on a mountain bike, I think that would have changed things. Welcome to the I Race Like a Girl podcast, where a professional triathlete and an age grouper talk all things sport and life. We are here to educate and enlighten, but most importantly, to keep it real. We are your hosts, Amy Woods and Angela Nate. Let's race to it. Hey everyone, it's Amy. We cover a lot of ground in this episode. Angela recaps her first race of the season Mid-South, a 100-mile gravel race in Oklahoma. We delve into why she loves gravel so much and why it's good for triathletes to get off their TT bikes sometimes. We then switch gears and move into the madness of March and how patience during spring training will pay off later in the season. We end with some things to focus on right now to set yourself up for success during the summer months. We hope you get a lot out of this one. Have a listen. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the I Race Like a Girl podcast. It is Amy and Angela. And Angela, welcome back from Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> Good old Oklahoma. <laughs> Were, wait, was the wind sweeping down the plane as the song goes? Was it windy? <laughs> oh my gosh, it is so windy there. Yes, I mean. So this the Broadway yeah. song is true. It's true. It's very true. <laughs> very, very true. For those of you who don't know, Angela just got back a couple days ago from the Mid-South uh, gravel race, and there were other races too. There was a big long trail race. Um, and so... I, we know that you placed 11th overall, is that right? Um, in yes. the 100 mile race? Yep. And yep. first in your age group, you crushed it. Uh, not surprising, but still uh, mm -hmm. needs to be said. So I want to know all about it because uh, it was, there was just a lot of buzz on social media. I followed it. There were some big crashes. There were some big names. There were some fast times and there was some mud. Um, so tell us about Mid-South. Yeah, so backtracking a little bit, Mid-South was not on my radar because um, I did sign up for the Lifetime Grand Prix. So Mid-South is a well-known gravel race that I've been intrigued by, but I've seen the pictures from like a few years ago and it's just completely mud and muck. <laughs> and I'm like, that is not for me. Um, but yeah, my no. sponsor, Orange Seal, uh, it was kind of a requirement to do this race. And so there was a bunch of friends that were from the Cape here that were going. So I thought, okay, well, this is an easy way to, to do it all together and have some fun. So ended up going. Um, the race itself is, well, I guess Oklahoma is very rolling. There's not a lot of trees, if, if any. So it gets very, very windy. <laughs> Um, the yeah. terrain itself was gravel, um, but kind of like a soft, muddy type. Uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. I, well, maybe it was fortunate, I don't know, but it snowed the day before the race. And so it was freezing. So I was, so I had Pearl Zumi send me like so much gear because I just didn't know what to wear. And I am not good with cold. As soon as my hands get cold or feet get cold, um, it just goes to waste. So that was a little bit of uh, anxiety on my end, but we were well prepared. I bought space blankets and I put space blankets <laughs> on me, um, in my feet. I had like three pairs of socks on. Um, so the start of the race was 28 degrees and by the end it was about 45 oh degrees. God. And so that was doable. That was doable. 45 is doable, but it was windy the whole time. Yeah, I mean, like, the course itself was um, a lot of squares, kind of, and so you would get a headwind oh, okay. for, say, 15 miles, and then turn right or left, and then headwind again, and um, so, you know, gravel racing's tough. It's, you, you start in a group with men and women, and men are a little bit aggressive. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so are women, but when you have, like, a thousand people lined up with bikes, it as a triathlete, I'm not used to that. And so the first part of the gravel race is always an, 
a neutral start, and that's kind of in um, quotation marks because uh, a lot of people don't go neutral. <laughs> so the max oh, yeah. speed is supposed mm-hmm. to be about 18 miles per hour. Um, but this race actually was a neutral start until the gravel, um, because we had a lead car that was like legitimately making sure we were going 18, which is fantastic. Okay. Um, but as soon as you hit the gravel, you don't see what's ahead of you. And so you have to rely on the rider in front of you. And I don't know who I'm riding with. And so I just don't have the experience like a lot of people do or the confidence of handling my bike in such a big crowd. So my fault all the time is I always go to the left or right of the big crowds, but as soon as you hit gravel road, I mean, that's when the road cambers or it it goes into the ditch. And so it's just not a good position to be in, but that's where I always find myself. (laughs) So then I slow down because I'm going to go into the ditch or people, and then I just lose the group. And so that's kind of what happened. (laughs) Um, If you were to see my splits. So are you, when you're in a group, are you like that big mass start? So are you like... Is it like when you're on a group ride and you're drafting and pulling, like you really do just follow somebody's wheel on a gravel road? Because that, that, like you said, if there's an obstacle or a rut, like you don't see it. So you're, is that what it's like? Yeah, but it's a little bit more sketchy because you have, because not everyone is aligned properly and you have about 10 people abreast. You know, like, like we take the entire road. Gotcha. So it's not until things start separating in terms of like speeds and stuff, then it goes into like a normal group ride basically. And that's where you can like push and take turns, take turns in the front or find, find people to ride with. But the first like hour of these rides are nuts. <laughs> um, they're super fun when I look back at it. <laughs> It does push you out of your comfort zone, but I remember Mm -hmm. when we were lining up for Rooted, which probably, which wasn't even as crowded as I saw the pictures from Mid-South, we were lining up for Rooted and I'm, I must've gone there early or something. And then people started like crowding around me for this mass start. And I just kept like backing my bike up. (laughs) And I was like, I am not start. I was like, this is a big no. And I just kept moving to the back because I was like, I don't want to be in that craziness. And that wasn't, and that wasn't even as big as what I saw in, um, in mid South, the pics look awesome, but it probably, like you said, is terrifying being in the middle. So you, you, but you made it. Yeah. Did yeah. you see any crashes in the beginning? Um, there was oh. one crash. So I saw the aftermath. I think there was probably about six guys. Um, some of them were behind me at that point. Like they were still on the side of the road. Um, there's always crashes. And that's kind of one of my biggest concerns because, you know, I want to do triathlon and I am in triathlon and I'm going to, to some pretty big races. And so I don't want to just injure myself I mean no one wants to get injured um but there is a couple crashes up at the front and that's why you just have to really be careful um and be really cautious of where your front wheel is it's really the front wheel that you kind of want to secure so actually a friend of mine Mm -hmm. suggested like think of a box in front of your front wheel and you want to you want to safe like that's your safe zone and you want to keep that safe and so Mm -hmm. as long as you have that um that's helpful Um, the race itself was, I mean, it started freezing and I had such a stupid debate with myself about what gloves to wear. And so I had, I had, how about the lobster gloves? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. So, so I knew it was going to get up to 45 and I love the Pearl Zumi lobster gloves, but I, I knew that I would end up throwing them and I didn't want to lose them because I love them so much. Yeah. So I ended up hiding them in uh, underneath the porta potty at the start because I didn't want to. (laughs) And they were there at the finish. Um, But I ended up wearing uh, Blue 70 swim gloves that were neoprene. And then I put another cover on top. And that actually worked well. My hands were freezing at the start, but about 45 minutes in, um, they were fine. Um, I I actually, Mm -hmm. as I was riding, I was like, oh, no, I'm in big trouble. Because once I lose my hand dexterity, I'm... I'm gone, mm-hmm. uh, but it ended up being okay. And then uh, I wore a jacket over um, my hydration system. So I wore a hydration system on my back. And at mile 43, there was an aid station, and I threw my jacket to a gal. And it was actually at the finish line, so that was awesome. But otherwise, I just kept everything on. So um, I like to be pretty warm when I ride, so I had probably five layers on. <laughs> Which is a lot. Yeah, but. I like to be warm on a ride too. 
did so you said the aid station at mile 45 did you use the aid stations a lot or did you kind of cruise through them no there's only a couple aid stations and so i like to wear a hydration oh. pack and then i have two water bottles on my on my bike um it was 100 mm-hmm. miles and so at mile so i mean that's about five water bottles and that that was that was good for me with the temperatures i drink quite a bit and so if i so if it was any warmer um i would definitely have stopped there was another there was a few others um i think mile 80 and then there was like a shot one where you could actually take a whiskey shot at mile 92 which i did not nice. stop for nice yeah it's kind of a it's a really fun community and environment like it's 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 definitely, as they say, um, party in the back end, you know, and, and racing in the front of the, of the race. Um, so if you want to be competitive and strong and really try for, you know, a placing or something, you really race in the front. But then if you're there to really finish and have some fun, I mean, they always bring in things like music and like the whiskey shot to stop or yeah. like a place to take pictures uh, so it's a really fun event for basically anyone that loves to ride. Nice. And what was, did you, what was your favorite part? Well, I love when the first hour 20 is done <laughs> 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 because then I'm just in my element and I am such a grinder. I have aero bars on my gravel bike, which I absolutely love. And I love pulling. And I mean, mm-hmm. I know that, you know, in a group dynamic where I have a lot of women around me and say I'm trying to get a placement, I would probably do better, obviously, not pulling a lot. But um, I kind of knew that I wasn't going to make any more placements, maybe possibly a couple. So I just mm-hmm. thought, you know, this is a really awesome ride. I'm going to push it to what I can to get as much fitness out of it as possible. Um, so my goal is just to kind of gain as many people as I can. And so I would ride with a few guys. Uh, we would take turns pulling. Um, but by mile 60 or 50 or 60, I was riding with a couple people. I caught up with a group. Um, and there was a group of four of us, but I did quite honestly, primarily all the pulling, um, cause I'm just a grinder. And then I caught a friend's group at mile 84, uh, Chase, and uh, we had some fun. So he, so he was pretty excited to race to catch with me and ride with me as I was with him because it's always fun when you know somebody because then you get like, okay, yeah. how about we try this? How about we try that? So we did some pulling together and. Um, yeah, it was just super fun. So then at the finish line, we tried to sprint it to the end to each other, and I think we actually tied um, in the in the thing. So that was so that was pretty cool. That is fun. That's so different than triathlon because in triathlon, oh my gosh, you have to keep a certain distance, and you know you have this much time to pass, and you get you know. You see the race official and you get, a, even if this is, that's my personality. I see the race official and I like, oh my God, he's looking at me, even though I'm clearly not like in the draft zone or anything. Um, so that sounds like it's like just way more fun to work as a team and to have some fun, you mm-hmm. know, with a group as opposed to just racing completely solo. Yeah. And that's what I kind of love about it because you like, it's a totally different type of racing. So you kind of have to learn, and this is still something that I have to kind of get out of the mindset of a triathlete. So triathlon, you don't want to have these peaks and valleys of your heart rate and like like pushing really, really hard up a climb and then re- and then going kind of easy um, because it's a lot better for the system as you swim, bike, run to kind of have a steady, steady effort the entire yeah. time because you're not burning all your matches. But in cycling, it's so different because you have such powerhouses going up these climbs and it's it's about making breakaways or pushing and then trying to like reset reset, reset yourself behind someone so you can um, recover and then try it again. So it's a it, it's just totally different racing and uh, it's super fun. I mean, it is challenging. It uh, some of the like I see the most power sometimes that I've ever ridden when I do these races because I have to power so hard up these hills because people just go bad out of hell. <laughs> and if you don't make it, yeah. you're not going to make the group. And so it, it really challenges me. Um, and then the terrain itself is is a totally different 
dynamic. Like you have to pay attention. And if you've ever been on a mountain bike, I always love riding mountain bikes because you have to be completely aware of your surroundings, yeah. everything that's around you. And so that's the same thing as gravel, but you're going for a really long time. And so I really love connecting both those worlds for me. And I mean, by the end of the race, you're pretty tapped out because mentally you're, you're, you're aware the entire time you're watching people around you following all this stuff. And then also, I mean, the actual aspect of riding itself takes a toll and, um, but it's just such a great feeling at the end of the finish line. (laughs) Yeah. That I saw one technical part. They showed some videos of that mud fest. Did you walk? Did you run it through there? There were people running. There were people yes. riding so, through that. I was like, what are you doing? Yeah, the race, it's, uh, so I guess the top male pros, maybe some female pros, I'm not sure, like the top end of the race, they rode through it. I don't know how to do that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I got off and ran as much as I could um, and then yeah. got on about halfway through and rode the center of it. Um, but otherwise, yeah, that, there, there was one part that was about, maybe not a full mile, but it was, it was mud and muck and, uh, I mean, not rideable to me. (laughs) And then there, and then at mile 92, um, there was this huge rut in the road and I was pulling a group of like 30 guys. It was awesome. I I mean, I just love that. (laughs) Of course you were. But I pulled off, (laughs) (laughs) I pulled off and I actually ended up in this like, uh, foot deep, um, rut and I was so scared because I'm not someone to like go on a bridge and, and maintain a solid line. Like that freaks yeah. me out. So being in this yeah. rut totally freaked me out. And so I had these 30 mm-hmm. riders come by me and they're all screaming at me. They're like, hold your line, hold your line. Don't crash, don't crash. And I'm just like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and it lasted for like 50 feet. And I was, I literally oh went through the process in my mind. I'm like, okay, if I crash, I'm going to try to lean on to, into someone like, it was just full on like shit. That, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you, <laughs> we just put explicit. We put the e on the yeah, podcast, okay, good. <laughs> and then it's then it's fine. So, <laughs> so honestly, now we're free to cuss because yeah. the e's on there. Going through my mind was like, holy shit, I'm in big trouble, you know. Um, but yeah. I managed to get out of it, and I was super proud of myself. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Oh my God. That's like, that was me. You were talking about the bridge. I was thinking, cause you were like, oh my God, don't crash. That was me on a mountain bike going over a tiny bridge in Stowe. And I was like, you can do this two foot little bridge. Just don't look down. Don't look down. And what do we tell ourselves about saying positive instead of negative? So I kept saying, don't yep. look down. So I looked down <laughs> and then I just <laughs> fell off the bridge, like hurt my wrist and then walked my bike up to the top, crying the whole time and then yelling for my husband And that was it. So I would have been like, I would have crashed. (laughs) Um, The cool thing about Mid-South is there was this, they do this really, I saw this really cool thing. I don't know if you were there. You were probably, it was the very end where they have this like giant like head of a animal that they put in the road for like the last finisher, the the DFL. Did did you see that? I saw it on the thing. No, I did not see that. But, But what's really cool about this race is the race director, Bobby, he is so enthusiastic and I mean, it's almost nutty. Um, <laughs> at the beginning of the race, he just like in like ex- is so excited and, and really like ramps up everybody. Everybody's amped at the beginning of the race. And he literally has a goal to hug every single finisher that crosses the line. And it's, it's, Aww. it's nuts. Like he's, he starts at whatever time we started. Um, well, well actually the race started an hour later because it was freezing. <laughs> oh. So we didn't start till nine, but then, uh, my group that I went with, we came back to the finish line for awards and stuff and just to kind of watch. And Bobby was still out there and it was probably nine thirty at night and in, and in like, he was still in a t-shirt. I mean, it was freezing. I, 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 I had a space jacket on and a beanie and like all the I saw a picture of you. You were like, (laughs) he's like the Um, Mike Riley of, of, he's like the Mike Riley of gravel. (laughs) Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. That is so awesome. Well, I mean, not that it was a surprise, but congratulations on that awesome finish because that is the beginning, you know, that was the first, you know, race of your race season. You have a big race season coming up with, triathlon and a lot more of these rides mountain bike gravel for the lifetime series um and i think i remember asking you i was like well 
were any of the top 10 women like triathletes? Are they also swimming and biking? And your answer was no. And so you're trying to do three (laughs) sports and Mm -hmm. holding your own with all these like really amazing female cyclists as because you are one. Um, And I think that is fantastic. So the thing about gravel, like jumping into these events and stuff, is just so much fun as an adjunct to triathlon because sometimes, you know, the daily grind of swim, bike, run with the same stuff week in and week out, although I love it. I mean, I absolutely love it. It's my lifestyle. It's my, I mean, I just, I mean, it's my passion. Jumping into gravel and bringing in the dynamics of like riding a mountain bike and and learning different skills, it it just it just opens up a whole new avenue and it excites me. And so when I do my TT rides, I I have a lot more mental capacity for for that because I'm not always just on that bike. I'm I'm going in exploring open roads, um, gravel roads. I'm going on my mountain bike and trying new skills that I've never done before. Um, so it balances things out for me and I wish, I so wish I started this, you know, 10 years ago because it would have changed yeah. things for me. Cause there came a point in my career, like six years ago. I mean, it, it was tough sometimes, you know, but if I just had a mountain bike and just went out and enjoyed being on a mountain bike, I think that would have changed things. Um, and in regards to that, I had a coach that was like, never get on a mountain bike because you're going to crash and da, 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 da. Yeah. But I'm like... I can't live in a bubble. You just can't live in a bubble. Like if you want to live in a bubble, you can live in a bubble, but (laughs) you, you take precautions. Um, I mean, I know my limits and yes, accidents happen, but on the road accidents happen too. I mean, I've crushed on the road and broken bones. Um, and it was far more intense than me probably falling off on a mountain bike. I mean, I, I don't know, but I mean, things happen. And so you just have to love what you're doing and, and, and know what your abilities are and your capabilities are. And so, you know, I'm not going to go jump off cliffs and stuff. I mean, I'm not there. <laughs> but, but like, I'm definitely gonna, you know, challenge myself because that's what life's about. You know, I, I mean, at least that. Well, yeah, that's what my I, life's about. I've been, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Everybody is about, about mm-hmm. challenging yourself in different ways. I mean, I I have been actually out on my gravel bike just on the road right now. I've been I've done some gravel roads. Mm-hmm. I mean, we don't have like I think people get confused cuz you talk about gravel and people think it's like actual just gravel. And gravel is like dirt. It can be mountain bikey, but a lot of times it's just like dirt roads or off the beaten path. Um, you know, and I just like riding my gravel bike on the roads right now in March because the streets aren't swept. You can go over anything. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't ever care what my speed is. People get super caught up in like, oh, that ride only showed me going like 16 miles an hour on Strava. It's like, well, who cares? (laughs) My my rides are always super, super, even on my TT bike, my rides are always super slow compared to my race things because I I ride super cautiously on the roads because I don't want to die and I don't trust Mm -hmm. anybody. But um. (laughs) Yeah, I've been having fun on my gravel because as we both know, I do not love the trainer. So if it's like kind of nice out, I will be outside, but not on my TT bike right now because it's still like craptastic up here. But like (laughs) I'll I'll get on my gravel. I just love it. Yeah, it's it's super fun. And I always recommend some like if you're if you're a cyclist or a triathlete, get a bike that you can kind of go on any roads. And once I got my gravel bike, I I just I love it. I I love the variety. It it really opens things up. And again, yeah, gravel can be sand. It can be it can be a single track. It can be an open road. It can be a gravel road. It can be I mean, anything you want it to be, basically. And uh, that's what I love about it is you literally have so much more opportunity to explore and have fun. I know. Yeah, because I did end up on single track on Friday on my gravel bike, and I thought <laughs> I, I was going to die. I took a picture and sent it to Angela, yeah. and I was like, what? Right? Where, where am I? What route am I following? This is nuts. But I just walked it because when I wanted to. But it was really, you know, it's cool because you get off the beaten path. And that's, you know, also like where we are in March and April – People are getting sick of their trainers, um, Mm -hmm. maybe at least. And it's, I think it's just time if you can do it. And you, even if you have a mountain bike or a hybrid bike, bike, you know, riding outside for me is always, always will be above riding inside just for Mm -hmm. bike handling Mm -hmm. for, you know, you were talking about 
the mental aspect of staying focused. Um, I mean, there are times and places for indoor trainer rides for specificity, but as soon as that weather warms up, like it's time to just do start doing some rides outside and, you know, even just practice getting your water bottle out um, and, (laughs) you know, and things like that. But there's just such a, it's such a mental boost to be out in the fresh air and not in front of a computer screen hooked up to like every device (laughs) and like making sure all your technology is working. I mean, how many comments do athletes leave in training peaks that like this, this disconnected and this pedal wasn't pulling Mm -hmm. the power and I don't, you know, and then like, that just like ruins a workout. (laughs) And I don't even, I don't have power pedals on my gravel bike. So, or anything like that. Sometimes yeah. I don't even wear my heart rate monitor. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> I just go out. Yeah, I mean, that's the, I mean, I mean, I use all different type of parameters, but when, like, like, even for this gravel race, I have power, power on my bike, but you can't look at it. I mean, you, yeah. like, you have to race, and that's what I love about it is, you know, you just, you really have to go by feel and effort, and you know, even when you're mountain biking, I don't know how people can, can look on their computers because I'm, like, glued to what is around me. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And that's what I love about it. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. Mountain bike is just like the whole time. I'm like, well, you know me. I walk everything. I walk it. And Angela's like, you could have ridden that. I'm like, no, I'm good. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah. So you are going. Your is your next race is? California 70.3, which I'm not quite ready for. And I guess... I guess that's a good segue into, you know, where we are in the season. You know, it is March. Um, A lot of us can get pretty antsy or question where our fitness is um, because, you know, we've had a couple months of winter and, uh, you know, these races are coming up really fast. Like even me, my anxiety for this race is a little high. But then I try to put in perspective. It's like, you know, I probably will get my butt kicked, which, cause I'm just, I, I, I'm more of a diesel now, which is great. <laughs> I mean, I am getting older. <laughs> um, so Ironman is definitely where I am and my gravel racing. So the longer, the better. So some of these, uh, whippets for these half Ironmans, I mean, they, <laughs> they can run and it, it's, it's, uh, it's a fun challenge. And that's what I'm taking it as is, is, you know, my coach and I talked and it's, it's a build up toward the later season races that I want. And so putting races in perspective is a huge aspect, especially if you're going to do an early race um, and yeah. uh, you're coming out of the winter months. But, you know, so sometimes the winter training, indoor riding is so powerful to you because it's a constant, constant grind. And that effort and endurance and fitness that you're building, I mean, it transfers over really well like I've had some of my best races coming out of really solid indoor trainer rides yeah I did um Gulf Coast 70.3 last May May 7th was the race and that was the earliest race I've ever done I used to not like super early races because you don't you don't get open water you don't get a lot of road time I I think I rode my TT bike outside maybe three times before that race um Mm -hmm. I did get out on the gravel bike and and you know, it wasn't, it was a really solid race, but of course, tempering your expectations of your first, you know, race back and thinking about, um, you know, just going into it and seeing what happens. And also knowing that a lot of the people around you are in the same boat, Mm -hmm. um, is good. But yeah, March is a funny time because the weather starts to get warmer and you have some friends that are doing maybe a, an early season marathon. I've got friend, you know, Boston. And so you see people's training ramp up before your training ramps up because your race isn't until June, you know? And so <laughs> you start to play this little mental game of like, sh- should I be, you know, doing that? And should it's challenging because you left off and your last race was in the fall and you were in prime shape and you know, you detrain a little to recover and you just have to slowly, mm-hmm. like you said, grind away and come back. And those peaks and valleys are what makes you stronger. But yeah, it's a nice big reminder, like don't freak out over where you <laughs> are right now. Yeah, especially because, I mean, it's a long season. One of, uh, when I worked with a different coach, one of his main things that he always said is, you know, so many people get amped up for, you know, 
uh, May and June. And then by the time July and August hit, everyone kind of burns themselves out a little. And he used to ramp people up so that they could hit and nail July and August because that's where, you know, the prize money was. And so you really have to, like, balance what you're thinking of doing. And, um, you know, a lot of times what I like to do is if if I'm doing, say, two big races like Ironman, I like to build up to that race and then basically reset the year. So my, so my macro... Mm-hmm cycles are broken into these into like two or three sets per year versus looking at it as a whole thing as well so it's just a matter of how you want to schedule yourself and what races you're in Um, because you can't be in peak fitness the entire time and you can't expect to to maintain that like for six months I mean it's just not possible yeah and then the other aspect too is sometimes you can you can uh, race to get yourself in shape you know, what's mm-hmm. what's really interesting to me is so I didn't, haven't raced or gone hard really uh, before Mid-South. And so I did Mid-South and I got this huge, like I could just, like I worked hard and my heart rate was sustained at an average heart rate that I haven't sustained for an average heart rate uh, for <laughs> quite some time. Um, but the benefits and the boost from that, as long as I recover yeah. from it, I can already tell. Like, I mean, just like as a mental standpoint, I'm uh, f- physically, you know, it'll take a, like a couple weeks to feel that boost but I mean it just kind of opens things up like it's Mm -hmm. just like like uh as people say you know um taking away the cobwebs you know that that first race once you can kind of latch on to that feeling of racing and and the adrenaline um the next race will come that much easier so I'm actually really happy I did that race before Oceanside because Oceanside is a half Ironman where it's like you know it's gonna be hard (laughs) Yeah, and having something under my belt already is is a huge bonus to me because uh, you don't hurt as much when you're training alone. Like I just can't. And when you put yourself in the element of any type of race, you know, I am I have a very competitive mindset, and so I just want to go for it. And plus, I want to challenge myself. (laughs) I mean, yeah, Um, yeah. No, what you said about and the just the group dynamic. Like mm -hmm. I cannot on my trainer by myself. I cannot get my heart rate up high and it's hard for me to get my heart rate up on the trainer by myself but put me in a spin class and my heart rate is jacked because I'm with people you have Mm -hmm. a little bit of accountability you get excited and it's the same thing when you're in a race or if you're in you know whatever a group setting you know there's just it's just more fun it's more accountable you get a little competitive and you can push a little harder um and we spend a lot of time training alone um Mm -hmm which is fine. And I think, you know, racing to get in shape is a good thing. I think it also, we're coming at it from a triathlon perspective, um, running if it, people who are just sole runners, running is just super hard on the body, which is why top runners will only do, you know, two marathons a year. Mm-hmm. So we are going to take a quick break from our sponsor inside tracker, and then we will be back with things to focus on for March. Hey everyone. This episode is sponsored by inside tracker a company actually founded not too far from us in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Angela and I both use their blood testing and analysis to make sure our bodies are optimized for the training we are doing. Whether you run, ride, hike, or swim, you understand what it means to push harder, reach farther, and go the extra mile. This relentless drive runs in your blood. That's why Inside Tracker provides you with a personalized plan to build endurance, boost energy, and optimize your health for the long haul. Created by leading scientists in aging genetics and biometrics, Inside Tracker analyzes your blood, DNA, and fitness tracking data to identify where you're optimized and where you're not. You'll get a daily action plan with personalized guidance on the right exercise, nutrition, and supplementation for your body. And when you connect Inside Tracker with your Fitbit or Garmin, you'll also unlock real time recovery pro tips after you complete your workout. It's like having your own personal trainer and nutritionist in your pocket. For a limited time, you can get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Just go to insidetracker.com forward slash I race like a girl. All right, so it is almost the end of March, which is crazy that is flying by. And people are coming out of their kind of base season or off season and we're starting to look toward our races some people have races in may uh, or june you know so what are some things that athletes should be focusing on right now 
uh, as we come to the end of March. Yeah, I think if we're looking specifically for triathletes, um, one of the biggest things, it's kind of the transfer of indoor to outdoor. Um, so, I mean, at, at the most basic level, just to get out out on your bike outside is going to be a huge transfer and change of pace. Um, so I would make sure that your bike is definitely tuned up. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's kind of a very simple one, but it's a huge one. And it's a good one to, you know, bring it to the bike shop, make sure your tires are good, make sure everything's just working and manageable to be outside. Um, <clears throat> another aspect is kind of a little bit more specific on what type of bike you have, depending again on how close your first race is. So if you have a race coming up, you know, April, May, I would get more on your TT bike as much as possible because uh, it is more specific and just the angles are different. Um, power output's going to be a little bit different. So it's good to practice on the bike that you're going to be racing on. Um, and in terms of swimming, what I love to do is I, st like, I, I definitely do strength all the time just because I, I'm a, I'm a more weaker swimmer. And so I feel uh, a lot more paddle work is, is beneficial for me. Um, but another one to do is kind of incorporate how you're going to sight because um, that takes a lot of energy and practice. So what I like to do is as I get closer to races, I like to lift my head up a lot more and just kind of practice sighting every six strokes because it is kind of a pattern and a rhythm um, until you can actually get out into open water for sure. Um, I always, I, I definitely do that a lot and it kind of gets me in the mindset okay I'm gonna be racing soon so I have to so as soon as I start lifting my head you know it just changes my mindset a bit more when I'm in the pool um for running uh I mean running for for me and my athletes is all about consistency and just um continuing that but you know you're starting or you should be starting a little bit of speed work um if you have some early season races um or some pacing efforts what I always like to do uh, with a lot of athletes is just do really short bursts like a fartlek where you're changing paces in a run mm -hmm. um, just to kind of get, you know, the cobwebs kind of burnt out a little bit and then jump into some of the races. You can also use some races, obviously, to build into the season. So if you have an early season race like April and you come from a very winter climate, maybe that's not your A race, but use it as a building block towards something in June, July, um, it's just how you want to want to look at your season, but it is a long season. So, you know, a lot of us get really antsy when it's March, April and spring's just around the corner and it, everything's changing and we get like super antsy and excited. You know, you, you want to look at the season as a whole. So, I mean, if there's a building block that your coach is having you on, make sure you keep it up to that and uh, not get too excited, but it is fun. <laughs> yeah. You had talked about earlier how, you know, people sometimes we'll just peak too early, um, you know, yeah. and so they'll just kind of put so much energy into early season training, which is great, but forgetting that maybe they have a race in October. And, you know, like you said earlier too, mm -hmm. you know, you're using this Oceanside race, you know, that's going to help prepare you, you know, for the later races. And so I even mm -hmm. want to go back when we were talking about things to work on for March, right, and where you should be in March, you know, even breaking down further what you said with the bike and getting outside um, and contact your bike shop because it is still really, really hard to get parts. And so mm, if is. your bike needs a part, um, even some tires are hard to come by, you know, <laughs> you want to contact your bike shop and, and so they can order that. I mean, they might have it, they might not because you might be waiting for that, that part and that is you know, really important. And then, um, with this, I actually have a question for you about the swim. Um, I remember a long time ago, you said that you do use, you use paddles a lot for strength work, but you said that as you get closer to your season, um, mm -hmm. you drop some of the paddles and you work on speed work. Are you mm -hmm. doing that now? Or are you still, or are you just, are you still more strength heavy with your swim? You know, um, my coach is trying something different with me a little bit more. We're, we're, we're kind of breaking down the swim stroke to either pulling, mm -hmm. band only, or straight kicking. Like, I think I did 1,500 kick the other day, oh my <laughs> which was a lot. 
Um, but I, we, what we find like in the past years that when we've worked together, that when I break it down, I, I, I do better. So mm-hmm. maybe it's because of the focus on specific aspects of the, of the stroke. Um, but yes, you definitely want to bring in speed just like any of the sports you want to, you know, as you get closer to your races, you want to bring in kind of some race specific, um, activations and runs and bikes and swims. And so speed is huge. I, I really like short stuff. So let's say 50, 25s. I've done that many, many times where I'm just like going hard for 25 and then repeating that 50 times over. Um, mm-hmm. And that kind of gets you into the rhythm and the pacing that you need. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, the other thing I was thinking about uh, because I'm about to do it. I mean, we just had the ad for Inside Tracker, but you and I both use Inside mm-hmm. Tracker, and it's a really good time mm-hmm. to kind of get your levels tested to see where you are and if you need to, you know, work on anything before you get into your heavy, heavy training um, and check that, you know, you're especially for women, iron panel mm-hmm. is okay, vitamin D. That's why I like using Inside Tracker because I have a hard time getting, um, getting, uh, what is it like like my doctors won't do that full panel unless yeah. there's something wrong with me so I was like well I'll just do it myself <laughs> yeah no I yeah actually I just got I, I just got tested a week ago so I'm waiting for my results but um yeah I mean it's perfect timing because it takes a while for if you do have low vitamin d or iron you want to get on top of it right away so that you know in a month's time you can see changes um because that's when the race season starts so that is it's, true. It's perfect timing, mean, really. Yeah, yeah. And then in terms of kind of nutrition, I like to spend the early season um, just kind of dialing in my fueling and making sure if I'm going to change any fueling, like if I want to change the, if mm-hmm. I want to switch to a sport drink or if I want to try more liquid nutrition on the bike, that I'm trying it a little bit now. Um, and seeing if my gut handles it. So you're not in big race prep and having issues. Um, so that's another thing. Are you, are you, are you, the only thing that you're trying right now is you're trying those ketones. So you're doing that right now. Yeah. I, I, uh, what I like to do is do, uh, have a lot of variety in what I take on the bike and the run. And so when I take, fuel from the race course. I know that my, my gut can handle it. Um, but my biggest goal is just to make sure I get the grams of carbohydrates per hour. And that's like around 80 grams per hour. Um, and that's, you know, whether that be through sports drink or whatever you want to do for me, I like sports drink and gels. I mean, that's, Mm -hmm. I just love that. Um, but that's a big focus. I think that everyone should do as you ramp up your training too, uh, you'll find that it'll help with recovery and, um, especially for the races itself. Like you don't want to try something new, you know, if you can train your gut, you're one step ahead of someone who does not do that. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. And, you know, thinking about not trying something new, you know, looking at the rest of your equipment and thinking like, all right, am I going to try some new sneakers? Like this is the time to start doing that. I switched, I made the dumbest mistake in a my first marathon build. I switched styles of sneaker um Uh, like 10 weeks eight weeks before my marathon and so i i switched these sneakers and they were a little cushier mm -hmm. and i was already running long mileage and i gave myself a calf injury like 10 Mm -hmm. days before my first marathon um ended up shutting the running down and doing okay at the marathon but like i don't it was so new so i switched equipment like well into training when I was doing all these long distances. So, you know, um, I saw a friend on Instagram. She is like trying to find a new saddle for her tri bike. You know, it, now's the time to do it. Go get your, you know, before you start doing those super, super long rides, like play with your equipment. Mm-hmm. You know, do you need a new wetsuit? Um, you know, and really trying to think ahead. So, when things ramp up, you have everything locked in. You don't have to like be futzing with all of that. That's (laughs) exactly, exactly. All right. So to wrap it up, um, as we think we started talking with gravel and that awesome mid South race and kind of where everybody Mm -hmm. is in March. Um, and I am going to put you on the spot and I would like to know three things that you're looking forward to in this awesome month of racing you have 
uh, coming up because your next race is a mountain bike race, which is outside your yes, element. Which is and then nuts. you go into <laughs> a fast and furious 70.3 that is going to be the opener for kind of like the North American triathlon season. Yeah. And yeah. then you go almost, you know, just a few weeks later um, into you have Sea Yacht. No, wait. First, first oh, wait, is getting, California. First is California. Thank you. I'm getting yeah. my dates confused. Then you go into a mountain bike race and then you go into um, the world championships in St. George. So you mm-hmm. have a really exciting um, month coming up that some of it's a little outside your comfort zone. So what are three things that you are looking forward to in this big month of yours? Um, you know, the whole, the whole idea of me jumping into these gravel races and mountain bike racing is just to challenge myself and to mix things up. I, you know, as my career progresses and when I was introduced to gravel, I'm like, wow, this is something I really, really love. And this is like the whole idea of the longevity of the sport for me as well. Um, I mean, I love Ironman. I love triathlon, but I found this new love for something that I never thought I could even do before, you know, like mountain biking and stuff. And now as an athlete that does TT rides and stuff, I'm not good at mountain biking. So I'm really looking forward to the challenge, even if I come last. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it really is a challenge for me. And that's, that's what I'm looking at it as. And it's something that I can improve on. And, um, you know, I just got a new mountain bike and it's super fun to just see the progress just within a couple weeks of, you know, practicing some simple trails and, and stuff. Um, obviously the ride that I'm doing is not too technical, so it's really based on endurance, which is fantastic. So I'm looking forward to that challenge in and of itself. Uh, a group of us, and you're, you're included in that group. We're going to go to California and do kind of a mini training camp together. And those are always fun because it really mixes things up. It's, it's a good way to kind of build, fitness together because sometimes you know those long days are are tough and it's just a change of pace um it really it really kind of jump starts uh the year and makes things really fun Mm -hmm. um and I'm also going on kind of like an adventure five week (laughs) uh travel so Mm -hmm. I'm not coming back to the east coast I'm going to stay on the west coast and go to Utah and so just being able to kind of be independent in that sense and and really just focus on um this upcoming Ironman, which is something that I've been looking forward to for a long time through COVID and um, my health and everything. So yeah, I'm yeah. those three things really. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And we will all be there to support you. Well, thank you everybody for joining us uh, for this podcast. We hope you got something out of it. And um, remember to, um, if you want to find us, we are on Instagram at Amy Woods Fitness and Angela Nath and Angela Nate's Coaching and at I Race Like a Girl. You can find us anywhere. Send us a message, reach out, uh, and have an awesome day. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening, and we hoped you enjoyed it. You can find us at amywoodsfitness.com and angelanath.com. We'd love to hear from you.